Uh, we now continue on with lightning talks, and I want to introduce Russell Keith McGee, who's going to run them. We have our first speaker come back up on stage. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Russell Keith McGee. If you have been to DjangoCon before, you've probably seen me. If you haven't, I'm sorry. Um, my job here is to introduce the lightning talks. However, it occurs to me from seeing this morning how many hands up say this is your first DjangoCon um, that you may not know what a, what a lightning talk is. A lightning talk is a short talk on any topic you want. If you've never spoken at a conference before, and maybe you'd like, you know, maybe dip, dip, uh, dip your toe into the water and find out whether conference speaking might be for you, a, uh, a, a lightning talk is a great place to start. It can be about Django, it can be about Python, it can be about software development, or it can be about anything else that happens to tickle your fancy. Uh, the Django Con stage has historically had some very entertaining talks about Zeppelins, for example. Um, the only thing it can't be is an advertisement or a commercial for a company or a job advertisement or something like that. If you want to do a commercial advertisement, may I suggest possibly next year sponsoring this fine conference, you get your logo on stage the whole time. Uh, it's a short talk, it is five minutes, and we do mean five minutes, an absolute maximum. Um, uh, with one minute, on the uh, one minute left on the clock, I will sort of slowly come back onto the stage. With about 10 seconds to go, our fine uh, organiser, Tobias over here, will start warming up the gong, and when time runs out, there will be a gong hit to stop all gong hits, at which point we will then find some way of dragging you off stage forcibly. Um, I say it, it's a maximum of five minutes. It can be less than five minutes if you so choose. Uh, there's no minimum length of time other than, you know, please don't waste our time just setting up your laptop for saying goodbye and walking off stage again. Um, with that, that is a lightning talk. This has effectively been a lightning talk about lightning talks. Uh, and I would now like to introduce Justin Mayer, who will talk to us about how to add multi-factor authentication to your Django project in less than five minutes. Take it away, Justin. Thanks very much, Russell. Uh, my name is Justin Mayer, originally from Los Angeles, California, but just last week moved to a mountain village in the Italian Alps in a region called Trentino. I've used Django for a long time, most recently to create Fortressa, which allows you to create your own uh, private self-contained VPN server. And today I'm excited to talk to you about multi-factor authentication. My goal is to show you how to add multi-factor authentication to your applications in the time that I have, which is obviously not very much. Um, last summer I gave a full-length talk on this topic at EuroPython. You can find a link to the video on justinmayer.com. Here is a very fast lightning uh, summary. Passwords are ubiquitous, they are terrible, most, t uh, most time people get around them by using SMS to send you a code. You've probably seen this. It's very common. Unfortunately, it's not very secure. A better method is TOTP or time-based one-time passwords. You may have seen it. You get a six-digit number generated usually on an app on your phone. Another method that I really like is called second, uh, is universal second factor. It's a small USB key. I have a tiny one in my machine right now. It's a hardware key, the next generation of which is a web standard called web authentication. There's a project called uh, Django UT, uh, U2F that you can uh, use to add this. It does both TOTP and U2F, and I want to show you how easy it is to implement it and add multi-factor authentication to your applications. So let's do it live, and what could possibly, possibly go wrong? <laughs> so over here, what do you know? It's actually there. That's good. So um, first thing we're going to do is we are going to activate a virtual environment. And we're going to pip install Django and um, the uh, Django U2F package. Luckily, I've cached all these wheels, so I don't have to deal with Wi-Fi. Um, or at least, uh, yeah, there we go. So, and then we're going to clone the project. And the reason we're doing that is that we're going to use a sample project that's inside it. Uh, switch to that directory. We're going to install the requirements, also from cached wheels, thankfully. Uh, we're going to run migrations. So I know this is fast, everyone, but just try your best to keep up. Um, we're now generating a TLS key for the local host domain. So that, uh, I guess um, U2F requires TLS. Um, then we are going to now run our server and switch over to a browser. And we're going to go ahead and load um, once we bypass the yes, we know it's not a signed certificate. Uh, I'm going to log in, 
and I probably forgot to create super user because you know this is what happens when you're doing it live. Um, and okay, do that really quickly. Hi at foo.com. Okay, go back to the browser, hopefully. And now we can try this again. And now we have a screen where we can manage uh, uh, our, all, all our multi-factor authentication. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a, um, a, a U2F key, which I just did by putting my finger on it. It's now been added. I'm going to go back to the settings, and now I'm going to add a TOTP device. And I'm going to do that um, using an app on my phone. There's a variety of different ones. I use one password because I already used that to manage my other uh, passwords. Um, I, I tap it to add a new password. I'm going to scan the uh, scan the QR code. It's been added. I'm then given a uh, number to enter into this token field. Once I do that, it then registers the token and says device added. And then last, we're going to create some emergency backup codes. I may not have my device. I may not have my phone. This allows me to get in um, even in, uh, even in those cases. So we've proven that we can add those things. Now what happens when we log back in? So we log in as usual when I don't um, bork the password. And we can log in, uh, we, can, we can go ahead and log in via either of the three methods that I just added. I'm going to just put my finger on the security key and, and I'm in. It is really that easy to do. Um, And now I'm going to quickly just show you what the only difference between a standard uh, Django start project command and what uh, the, and the test project that I just added is what you see here. A couple of lines added to installed apps to add some needed packages there. A couple of lines added at the end of your settings file to do um, uh, login URL and redirection. This is uh, URLs.py. Um, it's just. <laughs> Thank you very much, Justin. Uh, next up on stage, we have Johannes Hopper. While he's getting set up uh, with the with the microphone and the uh, uh, and the laptop, um, I've just returned from PyCon US. Uh, when I was at PyCon US, I, I bumped into a, an interesting person, sort of wandering around, who was actually a uh, just returned from a different conference, all about wasps. Um, and at that uh, at that conference, they were um, you know, talking about whatnot and about, about about wasps, as you do. And they just decided to go for a bit of a walk around the town, and um, uh, came across a, a vinyl shop. He's selling old old LP records, and uh, in the store, in the storefront, they had an advert up, an advertisement up, that said um, that they had, had just had just released Wasp Noises as the as the uh, an album that had just been made available. And so, uh, world uh, expert in wasps sees an album for Wasp Noises, thinks I've got to get, I've got to find out about this. Decides he's going to go into the store. More details later. Um, <laughs> Our next speaker is Johannes Hopper, uh, talking about instant feedback, making reviews great again on the new GitHub checks. Everyone make him welcome. Hey, thanks. Uh, I'm not going to share any slides actually today because I didn't have much time to prepare. Um, I try to keep this very short, probably shorter than five minutes. Um, maintaining open source projects is really hard. I think a lot of people here can empathize with that. Uh, because they are maintainers, and other people can probably emphasize because they have a pull request hanging somewhere and with no response. Um, and we were also discussing that yesterday evening already on, on what kind of things are hard. And something that's very tedious as a maintainer is that comment like, hey, can you please remove the trailing white space, or can you uh, also wrap the doc strings at 80 characters? Uh, stuff like that just comes repeatedly up. And it's tedious for a maintainer. And it's also bad to hear for a first time contributor. It's just the negative feedback that you don't want to give to someone uh, that otherwise did a really good job. Um, luckily, something we heard earlier this morning as the first talk, uh, the machines are taking over. And over time, we built a lot of great linters that help us do that job. Um, but they're still, even though those do a really good job of giving you kind of machine feedback, which is a bit softer to the users, to the first time contributors or frequent contributors to tell them, hey, there's maybe a trading white space that you want to get rid of, or please add a new line to the end of the file. And 
This is all great, but they're still kind of hidden usually within our continuous integration suites. Um, there's this one link to the Chavez suite, or use maybe Circle CI, and there are a bunch of different services out there, and not everyone is familiar with all of those. And then you have to find the section that actually failed, and you have to figure out what that means. Maybe you're not particularly familiar with that. Linter could be something like PyLint, and there are a bunch of checks you maybe don't know them all. Um, luckily, there has been a recent change um, on how GitHub works. There has been a new feature called Checks. It's currently still in beta. And the API is now also um, available in beta, uh, which allows you to kind of take all that onto a single platform. It allows machines to also add review comments, um, and it introduces the new concept of a check, which is really, really made for, for machine feedback for, for, for what we know as is, is Lintus currently. Um, so since that was released, a um, colleague of mine and, and me, we, we sat back and thought, hey, that's a cool thing. Let's try to bring those two together because they're made for each other. Um, so we um, put a lot of linters on AWS services, built a small service around it, uh, and combined all that in order to run checks automatically without any tedious setup on repositories and give this feedback directly back onto, onto GitHub without storing any data in between. It's just we process um, the, the data from the commit and we push our linting results back and the user can see them right where they, where they push their code. Um, if you're interested in that, in using that, or in contributing to making that better, because obviously it's just started, um, approach me. I'm Johannes Hoppe, uh, Coding Joe on, on GitHub. I don't know my Twitter handle, really. Um, uh, and talk to me about it. I'm excited to, to share. It's all open source, obviously. Um, yeah. So f just find me later if you're interested in those sort of things. And I hope that we can yeah, make, make contributing and maintaining uh, a bit easier. Thanks. Thank you, Hannes, and thank you, Hannes, for pointing out that it can be less than five minutes um, while our next speaker gets set up. Our uh, friend here has he's gone into the, into the store of the, the, the LP store, and he says, uh, I'd like to, like, can I listen to this record? Have you got, you've got an example I can, I can listen to? And the, guy, uh, the person behind the counter says, yeah, no, it's not, not a problem. Reaches, behind the, reaches down, gets up a copy of the record, says, just go over to the listening booth there and, uh, and get set up there. And um, once you're in the listening booth, I'll start the record and you can listen to it and see what you think. And so uh, he, he goes into the listening booth and the, the storekeeper goes behind the, 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 the record player and puts, puts it on and starts playing and a um, little bit more detail about what he hears in a moment. Next up we have Katie McLaughlin, serialization formats are not toys. By the way, you don't actually have to give your own lightning talk, you can give somebody else's lightning talk. This lightning talk was given as a full 30 minute talk by a guy called Tom Eastman. I'm going to give it in 4 minutes 45 seconds. Loading data into your application is the most boring part of your day. You want to get your data migrated into your app and then you want to keep on coding. The thing is, 90% of magic merely exists on knowing one extra fact. If I know one thing that your app doesn't prevent security wise, I can take all your data for myself. Everything I'm going to be talking about today is not a bug, it is a feature. So, this is my example uh, application. It's just a simple bottle app. All I'm going to be doing today is posting data to various endpoints and then returning back the content. So, let's talk about YAML. In YAML, if I was to post uh, my first name is Tom, my last name is Eastman, and I have an email address, I get back a uh, JSON uh, result with my email address, first name, and last name. What I can also do in YAML is I can post Python objects. So what I can do here is I can post back a Python object of datetime.date with my birthday. And I get back a, J a, a, a Python datetime object. Who can see where this is going? What I can also do is I could uh, tell it to uh, call subprocess and tell me the entire contents of my uh, directory that I'm in. So. I wonder if I can actually get my speaker notes to work. That would be useful. There we go. So, hey, I wonder if I can also get my slides to bigger. Yay, okay. So, what I could also do, instead of running uh, LS, um, what I could also do is not have my speaker slides work at all. Come on. There we go, all right. What I could also do is I could run RM star and then run an LS and I could uh, delete my entire presentation while I was working on it, uh, which is allegedly what happened to this speaker. So 
surely this doesn't happen in real life, right? It happens all the time. It happened with uh, Piston and Tasty Pie back in 2011. It happened with Rails twice. Uh, it happened in Puppet and everyone was really upset and then it happened for Node and no one cared. So how do you protect yourself? You make the parser stupider. <laughs> What you should be doing instead of using yaml.load is using yaml.safeload, which is really easy to find when all you're doing in your telesense thing is going yaml. Uh, okay, load, okay, I want the first one. What you need to be using is safeload. So let's talk about XML, a slide that's scary enough just in itself. In XML, we have entities. In an entity, I can define an entity as a uh, ampersand hash and then a number and then I get back a smiley face. What I can also do is I can put an alias to that entity. So instead of using the percentage number, I can have a smiley. So then I can have, yay, smiley, smiley. It's like emoji except not. So what I could also do is I could define an entity that's a bunch of other entities and another entity that's a bunch of those entities and I can have smiles going all the way down my page. This is also known as the billion laughs attack and it can turn your laptop into a smoking ruin including if you try to load your presentation slides in Emacs and it tries to render your XML for you. <laughs> so what else can we do? What we can also do is we could ask it to uh, return back the contents of our ETC release information or our password files or anything else because if you're running XML, you're probably running in, running in an enterprise environment and if you're running in an enterprise environment, you're probably running as root, which means you can do everything. Surely this doesn't happen in real life, right? It happens all the time. You don't even want to know. So how do you protect yourself? Just a simple list of things that you can do for your XML to make sure that it's not going to do anything. What you need to do is you need to make the parser stupider. What you can do is you can use Diffuse XML and a few other things. I have one minute left. Let's keep going. Jason, finally a stupid enough parser, only if you use it in a stupid way. Eval is not a stupid enough parser. Do not ever use eval to try to render JSON because on the documentation page, what it says is it says up there, here, you should use eval. And then right down the bottom, like somewhere where the orchestra pit would be, it says do not actually use this. Um, it also says it right there. It says, hey, you can use eval, but, but don't. But no one's actually going to keep on reading the documentation after they get their answer, right? So the lesson, beware of flexibility in your uh, applications and in your uh, serialization tokenizers because it will try to be smart and sometimes you don't want it to be smart. You want it to be dumb and you want it to play nice and you want to have your application still work at the end of the day. Disable everything you don't need and keep it simple. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Katie, or Tom, or Katie, not sure. Um, OK, so our, our friend's in the listening booth now, and he's uh, put the headphones on. And um, he's sitting there, he listens to the, the, the record starts playing, he starts listening, and he's like, this, something's not right here. I mean, it's an insect. I can tell it's definitely an insect. Um, and it, yeah, but there's something, something's just not right here. So he, he comes, steps out of the, out of the, uh, the listening booth, and uh, he goes to speak to the, to the store guy, the store, uh, uh, store uh, manager and says, hey, look, are you sure you're playing the right record there? Because um, I'm like a wasp expert. I'm pretty sure they're not wasp noises. And so the, the, the manager says, hang on, I'll, just, I'll get a different pair of headphones for you. We'll get you some good headphones. We'll try it again. So he goes and gets the good headphones, gets him set up with the good headphones, um, and uh, steps back over, moves back into the booth, uh, starts the record playing again. And he sits there and he listens a little bit to the, uh, to the, to the, to the sounds again coming through. And... No, we're still going. All right. Um, <laughs> so he listens and listens again. And no, there's something that's definitely not right here. There's something that's just not quite right in the sound that I'm hearing. And I'm a wasp expert. I know my wasps. That is definitely not a wasp. This album says it's wasp noises. It's wrong. It's not wasp noises. So he sits back out of the booth, goes back over to the store manager and says, look, okay, I, I don't know what to say here. It's definitely not wasp noises. There's something wrong with your record here. The manager says, well, I don't know, it's like it says here on the tin. I, how, I, I can only go by what it says here on the, uh, on the record. And the guy says, oh, hang on, I'll tell you what he says right after this break when uh, Johannes will tell us uh, why he hates CSV. Everyone. <laughs> All right, I don't seem to be the only one in the room, but I need to know precisely. So hands up if you have ever used CSV in a project. Hands up and keep your hands up. Everyone, excellent. So, for those with the hands up, um, who liked the experience? All right, who had it work on the first try? 
Okay? For those of you with the hands up, this talk is not for you. <laughs> right, so what do you do as a developer when you have to work with CSV? I mean, you have tabular data, so you think, okay, everyone uses CSV, so I'm going to use CSV. So what do we do at first? We go to Stack Overflow. <laughs> and, uh, of course, um, you read through this uh, thing and it's, it's really simple and, and all you have to do is, like, what? And then you look at the documentation and it, and it says uh, things like, Okay, I have a reader and it's really simple and yeah, I, I can register a, a, a what? I can, what? Why? <laughs> and the problem is, in CSV files, we use commas to separate records and we use new lines to separate um, lines, right? But sometimes we want to use commas inside of our, the strings that we want to serialize and sometimes we want to use new lines and then we have to find some kind of like escaping and we have to do magic to make it work and that means we have to mess around and we have several choices. We could use semicolons. Excel uses semicolons. So all of this comes from the fact that we don't have dedicated symbols for separating records and separating lines. Now let's go back in time to the 1960s and let's have a look at ASCII. I mean, imagine being the person uh, having this problem for the first time and um, looking through their ASCII uh, code and seeing, oh, a comma, I could use a comma. And um, what if we had dedicated characters for separating units and records and possibly even groups or files so we could have more than one table in, in, a, in a file. And these have been in the standard since before many of us have been born, right? But nobody knows them, nobody uses these. So we have CSV and we have this mess. I'm going to show you the code that we would need to use um, to use these ASCII separation things. And this is going to work every time. And as you can see, it's almost as complicated as the one that we had for the CSVs. So what to do? use ASCII separators if possible. And that's never possible. So, so the same thing to do is actually use, use SQLite. If you have tabular data, use SQLite. But there's a more important lesson and the important lesson is this hack that somebody put in 20, 30, 40 years ago is still with us and is still plaguing us. So don't put hacks into production. And even more so, if you put a hack into production, please think before you copy someone else's hack. And this is my message to you. Thank you very much, Johannes. And again, another Johannes under time. You do not need to be five time, minutes. Right? I can stay here and just... No, we've applauded now. That's okay. the end. You're done. You're done. We need to get back to the wasps. Um, so, uh, hang on. Hello. Wasp. More people. Just a moment. There we go. More people coming. Yes. There we go. All right. Oh, hang on. I thought you had finished. No, I'm finished. Oh, you had finished. Right. Okay. There we go. Right. Okay. <laughs> Right, so anyway, our, uh, our WASP expert's in the booth, he's had his second listen, he says, I know what I can do. I've just come back from WASPCon. Uh, I can go and find the world expert on WASP, he's a convener of this conference. I can bring him into the store, we can get him to listen to the album, and we can, we can get definitive, we can get clarification about whether this is a WASP or not. The store owner says, yeah, absolutely great, we'll do that. They come back the next day. Our next speaker is Bernard Buhlman, uh, talking about uh, Django for managers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> So actually, I'm a manager, but this is not a commercial talk. So I hope you, you will uh, use it for be commercially successful. Uh, so my, my name is Bernard Bühlmann. I'm co-founder and a long-term CEO of Four Teamwork in Bern, Switzerland. And I have a background of 15 years of Plon. So I know Python quite a bit. But now I became a sales manager. And um, you can contact me on GitHub, for example. Now, my problem was a few weeks ago, I had a deadline for a sales pitch and on Monday morning I came to my company and said I need to have a working prototype by Tuesday afternoon and it has to look nice. So um, my developer team says, um, no, that's, that's not possible, it will take us at least two weeks. So I go back to my office and um, I start to learn Django from scratch. <laughs> 
So I go to the website, simple is better than complex, and uh, two, three hours um, I did the tutorial and it didn't look nice, the front end, so I did some research and I found Django material. So I started my project on GitHub. I added requirements.txt, two lines of code. I added a model with some, some fields. I added a view and that's it. So I had a running prototype which looks like this. It's for creating user stories. I can add applications. I can add user stories, roles. I can add glossary, um, uh, subjects. I can add a new subject front end, for example. And when I when I add a new user story, I can choose this uh, new. Uh, subject again and if I want to change the application it's very simple I go to the code to my model and I add a description field to my application model I'm not so fast like the others I do the make migration the migrate and we run again and I go back to my application listing and I have the description all, all, all ready and um, it's really fast to, to make this development and I can, can also add a new column to this uh, listing just by adding the description to the view set. I hope this works. So I have the description here in the view and it's really very easy to develop and it's also uh, nice looking. So um, the whole thing is on GitHub and it's less than 500 lines of code, which is fantastic. And the developers, they ask me, um, where are the tests? And I said, well, it's not so many lines of code, so we don't need tests. <laughs> 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 so my goal is to, to reduce it even more under 400 lines of code. And you can try it yourself. Um, we have one minute left, so if you're very fast, you can have it running. On, uh, it's on our repository for teamwork, uh, user stories material. In the README, it's a description, and you should have it running in a few seconds or minutes. And if you have problems, you can come and ask me. And I hope that it will help you to get uh, success, to be successful in acquiring new projects by creating prototypes really fast. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bernard. And while our next speaker gets set up, so uh, they, they convened the next day, the uh, world expert in wasps walking, walking along with this guy who originally found the record store. And uh, they walk in, the guy behind the counter says, oh, yep, no, I remember you. Uh, so they get the record set up again, they get the expert into the booth. Uh, and he connects up the, uh, the, the record and the, the good pair of headphones, the really good pair of headphones, uh, and starts the record playing and the, uh, the, um, the expert sits there and he listens and he's really concentrating, you can tell he's concentrating um, and he's listening really, really hard. Um, and uh, he steps out of the booth and says, no, no, sorry, There's, I can tell you, it's absolutely not wasps. There's no, no chance whatsoever that's a wasp. Store owner goes back, looks at the record, says, look, it says here that it, you know, here's the species. It definitely says it's this species. He says, okay, I'll go back and have another listen. And he goes back in and he listens again. And he listens. He's thinking about it. He steps out of the booth again. He says, look, I can, I can tell you, there's absolutely no chance that's a wasp. It's, there's no, no wasps on that recording at all that you're playing to me. He says, well, maybe, maybe we should phone the publisher. We phone the publisher. And uh, they talk to the publisher and says, no, no, absolutely guaranteed that, that, that record, it's playing, it's got wasps on it. Um, and the, uh, the record store owner says, oh, oh no, I've just worked out what's happening. To find out what's happening, we'll have to wait until after Curtis. 
Curtis talking about understanding Django static files. Uh, hi, I'm Curtis Maloney, also known as Funky Bob online. I've been working with Django for 12, 13 years now. Um, and one of the biggest problems we have to help people online is dealing with static files for the first time. Hands up, anyone who got static files to work the first time they used it? Liars. <laughs> because nobody gets it the first time. Um, and part of the problem is the documentation must not be good enough. I don't know why. I'd have to read it again and again and again to see why. But I keep asking the new people, why didn't you understand it? And they say, I don't know. So maybe we should scrap it and write again. Anyone who's got something on the sprints that they want to do, maybe. So what happens is, with static files, all of your apps can provide their own static files. This is a source of static files for your project. You can also give a list of static files directories for where to find static files to collect. And then eventually you'll run the ManagePy collect static sta um, command, which takes all of these files and copies them into the static root. Here's problem number one that people run into is they think static root is where they put their static files whilst they're developing. No, that's where they get copied into. Then you configure your web server so that when somebody asks for something under the static URL, it goes and looks inside the static root. Now, it's only taken me, what, a minute to explain this, and it's about as long as it takes online to explain this. But it was necessary to save us all this times 500 to get this video so that we can actually tell people, go and watch this, and hopefully you'll understand static files after this is done. Thank you very much. Here we go, and Curtis providing evidence, in addition to myself, that if you want something done quickly, give it to an Australian. <laughs> so uh, that concludes our lightning talks for today. There's nothing else to go on, um, nothing else for me to say, but of course you all want to find out what happened to the wasps, don't you? So, yeah, okay. So we're back in the scene, we're in the, in the record store, we've got my friend, the wasp expert, his friend, the world-renowned wasp expert, and the store owner from the record store, and the store owner is just heads in hand. Oh, I'm, so, I'm so embarrassed. You are world experts in wasps. I'm a world expert in vinyl and record players. And I can't believe this has happened. I'm sitting here, I've put you in the booth. I've brought two of you in. I've brought in specialist headphones for the experience. I've played you a record, telling you that it's wasp sounds. I'm so, I'm so embarrassed. I played you the B side. Thank you very much. Lightning Talks will be back tomorrow. If you care to have a Lightning Talk, uh, please sign up and put your Lightning Talk on the list for tomorrow. And you may have the, the benefit of having a shaggy dog story in between it. Now, off to Marcus for closing for the day. <laughs>